support live, everybody. Gather around. Grab a comfortable seat. We're at a table. It's actually a big table, so grab a, there's enough room at the table for everybody to gather around. And we'll explore how we want to do the things we want to do in the week ahead. And I say that because one of the things I wanted to mention at the start, um, I was talking a bit about this on the, the Mental Fitness Discord server the other day, uh, and it's something I bring up all the time though, is the importance of making mental health work about the things we want to grow and keep. And this isn't just some kind of, uh, I don't know, like fake it, positive psychology gimmick. It's like really looking at what are you giving attention and importance and time and energy to, because that's the thing that's going to grow. Looking at what you, we build social interactions around. Because if we're building our social connections around things we hate, we are going to be very reluctant to step away from those things we hate because we'll be afraid we're going to lose our social connections. And if we've been telling the brain, like these things are really important because we've been spending all our time on them, it's kind of like holding on to an object. So say there's something in your home that you pick up every day and you just stare at it. So let's take any kind of positive or negative out of it. But there's just one object every day. As soon as you wake up, you check for it. During the day, you pick it up and you look at it. During the day, you, maybe you spend some time Googling. Uh, you go to some forums devoted to that object. And you, you want to hear other people's stories of having that object. You rate the day based on how many times you looked at that object. Are you going to find it easy to get rid of that object? I would say that you probably will not find it easy to get rid of an object that you've been touching, picking up, holding on to, and checking all through the day, regardless of whether it's positive or negative because it just becomes this familiar thing we're so accustomed to having and holding. So we've got to start to give attention to objects in that house that we actually want to keep and that are actually useful to us. So let's keep that in mind as we're exploring today. We'll try to keep bringing it back to actually what do we want to grow? Because the thing is, if we look at how do I do a thing well, we'll still address all of the concerns and problems and so on. But on top of that, we'll actually get to do something well, which is uh, wonderful. Hello, everybody. Stopping by in the chat. It's good to see you all. Bogos Vinted. I'm, I am having a good day. Hello. In winter, hello. Bogus, you have questions to ask. Go for it. Mundo, a wave to you. Maddie, hello, hello. Bogos Binti said, any tips on how to overcome OCD tics? Does that have anything to do with magical thinking OCD? It could get super annoying for me. It stops me from functioning. So the fact that you brought up uh, magical thinking OCD makes me think you've probably noticed it has to do with magical thinking. Because are, are you seeing the tics as controlling something? Um, and then... When you mention there, the other thing you mentioned, it stops me from functioning. So that stops me from functioning is one of the compulsions. So it could really help to look at what is it you're not doing because of these ticks. It's going to be really useful to do whatever it is that you're cutting out. Uh, but yeah, have you seen that these are connected to magical thinking? Mud, welcome. Erica, hello. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. I said, once we've decided what we'd like to grow and do more of, what is the next step? How do we actually implement it when making these changes uh, is so new to us? Yeah, so like, one of the things, and actually I was reading, oh, I'm going to forget the name of it. Uh, I listened to a Dharma talk yesterday and, and learned about... Uh, a uh, sutra that's in one of the kind of what's called, the, I think, the old Pali Canon uh, kind of uh, Buddhist sutras. But the reason I'm bringing it up uh, as relevant uh, to this discussion is because it's one of these, you know, very, very old texts. But in this particular one, 
um, and I'll share it later on the forum because I, I can't remember the exact name of it. Yesterday was the first time I'd heard of it. Uh, but it's the story of this monk. So this monk is hanging out with the Buddha in this town. And the, this monk uh, like really wants to meditate hard. And, and keeps saying uh, to the Buddha, hey, like, I, just, I saw there's this great mango grove over there. I just want to go. And, and he uses a term that we would immediately, I would say, recognize as, oh, this person's about to go and do a bunch of compulsions because he's like, I've, I've got to go and meditate really intensively. And the Buddha's like, chill. There's nobody else around right now. Why don't you just hang out? And when somebody else comes, uh, like other monks come, then, yeah, if you, you all want to go meditate, go for it. And then, but then he's like, no, 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 no. Like, he keeps asking him, like, hey, can I, can I just go to the mango grove? And I, I just, I really want to dedicate myself to meditation, like really intensely. And then Buddha's like, chill, relax. There'll be, you'll, you can do it later. And the guy's like, no, I've got to go do it right now. And then, and then so eventually, the, the Buddha has a, a phrase that I thought, uh, yeah, he's kind of like, uh, yeah, well, well, if you think that's such a good idea, go and find out. And the monk goes, and of course, what does the monk end up experiencing? And so he comes back pretty quickly uh, because he ran into uh, one of the translations translated the, it as non-profitable thoughts, but they were thoughts, which, I don't know what capitalist translation that came from, yeah, but they were thoughts about, uh, they were sexual thoughts, uh, thoughts of harm, and like uh, harming others, and there was one other uh, type that I'm forgetting now, but they were all like classic uh, OCD themes. And the reason I, I raise this because that you could tell that was going to happen from the way he wanted to go and meditate completely and intensely. I've got these things. I'm going to go fix them. I'm going to solve them by like meditating every day uh, nonstop. And we see that come up all the time. Like, ah. Uh, I'm gonna go exercise like really, really hardcore intensely and that's gonna solve all my problems. I'm gonna meditate, I'm gonna do recovery, I'm gonna, I'm gonna meet so many people and work on so many recovery skills, I'm gonna fix the problem. But that's just an extension of that same like fixing and controlling mindset. And so when we're making these adjustments, it really helps to make them lightly. And so yeah, if we are going to add in that's something extra that we do want to give our attention to. It's okay for that to just be small at first. Because if we weren't giving attention to it, to even give 30 minutes of, intention, of attention to it today is amazing. And maybe that's much easier to do. And then next week, we maybe take it up to an hour. Or maybe we do 30 minutes on something that we really care about in the morning and 30 minutes in the afternoon. And we just, so now we've created two chunks of time. And then we just gradually start to grow them over the weeks ahead. And often that can seem slow, but if we make a consistent gradual change every week over several months, the number of changes we can make in a year is enormous. But if we try to do like that monk and go like, no, I'm gonna be the like super meditator right now, um, often then the brain just takes that same fixing, controlling mindset, that really hard uh, pressure, and just starts applying it to even more things. Because um, the brain's like, oh, you like fixing your mental health? Well, fix this and fix that and fix that. Um, so yeah, lightly is what I would say there, Erica. And I'll find the name of that uh, sutra and uh, share it with you later. Oh, Kimberly, good morning. Thank you so much for the donation. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us today. Bogus Binted? I have not heard of that book, but I mean, if you're finding it a good book, that's great. And to Boho Mato, hey, that's great. You're finding things that you're finding useful. Marlos, welcome. In winter, he said, how will life feel like without OCD? 
Like, I am anxious all day and was full of compulsions. Can I function better? Yeah, so I would say life without OCD, uh, yeah, big advantages. Uh, so I used to have all sorts of like intrusive thoughts that like I would just see all sorts of terrible things all the time. Um, don't experience those anymore. So that's uh, a, a huge uh, kind of benefit. But that was not through trying to get rid of them. That was through making it okay for them to be there. Uh, compulsions, you mentioned the compulsions there. Um, a day full of compulsions. So it really helped me to recognize that both the intrusive thoughts were fueled by compulsions, the anxiety was fueled by compulsions, and I had to cut out the compulsions. Inside my head and the compulsions I was doing in my everyday life, including the compulsions I liked. Uh, so yeah, it's, it can really help to see that OCD is just a product of the compulsions. Um, that they are what is interfering in our life, like that in many ways there isn't an OCD thing. OCD is just what we use to describe the outcome of doing lots and lots of compulsions. And so yeah, when we cut out the compulsions, it's fantastic because we not only have just kind of the time that was spent on compulsions, we get that back, but you, I mean, a huge benefit is having so much more energy uh, and not like in a energy in a weird sense, like in a very practical sense, because worrying all of the time is exhausting. Doing compulsions all the time instead of doing things we actually care about, it's just really frustrating and we're not nourishing ourselves. Whereas when we give that time and energy to things that we really care about, we like that. And then we want to do even more of the things we care about. Uh, so yeah, to that question though, can I function better? Like it's, it's about us functioning better. So it's not, it's not like a thing that happens to us. Um, the practice is us, you know, noticing some kind of uncertainty or intrusive thought or pressure and instead choosing to do the things that are more useful to us, that we actually care about, that are about giving to ourselves and our communities. Jay, good morning. Renita. So this month I'm going to college. Ooh, congratulations. Yeah, I guess it is a college going time for a lot of people, right? I hope everybody's getting ready for the college. I said, I'm going to college. There's more to the question. And I have intrusive thoughts about losing control and yelling inappropriate things in front of people. I'm scared of attending classes. What can I do? Want to yell inappropriate things in front of people. There are likely a bunch of different compulsions. So that may be the fear that you're finding really intense right now, but that, that fear usually comes with a whole bunch of other compulsions around controlling what other people think. And it can be useful to look at them all because what the brain does is it sees that we like controlling what other people think. It sees that we like thinking about how are other people judging us. And then the brain is just trying to be helpful by going, oh, like we want to prevent people judging us. Okay, well, if we shouted something inappropriate in front of a crowd of people, wow, like people would really judge us then. So it's, it's just throwing up things to give you a chance to control them. So it learned to do that somewhere. So yeah, I would say one thing, look at the big picture here. What are all of the things you do to control what other people think? And some of them you may See, it's useful and necessary, uh, but exploring different ways of interacting with those practices, exploring how you don't have to control what other people think can be really useful. Uh, and then, yeah, the classic exercise with that fear is to say, okay, when the brain throws it up, you're like, okay, actually, yeah, I'm going to shout out all sorts of inappropriate things in class today, but I really look forward to learning. Something that can be really helpful for anybody that's getting started uh, with college or anything uh, coming up uh, is to identify some values about what we want to give. Because the brain will always worry about, oh, like, what if this happens? What if you do this? What if you do that? When we can say, look, okay, brain, like, yeah, that, that would be hilarious if I did it or like that. I'd be really scared of doing that. But what I'm going to choose to do today is to give this. I want to give support to my classmates. 
I want to give my attention to the professor. And I'm going to practice that. So really having a clear idea of what you're going to practice. And you can let the brain do whatever it wants to do while you practice that. Mutuza said, I can't help but ruminate waiting for a reply from a girl I met recently. She always replies late. She says that she's an introvert, hence doesn't always text. I know that she is interested. So, Mertuza, she never replies late. She has not replied late ever, and she is not replying late. There is no requirement for her to send a message on any schedule. It can be useful to want that. Because right now, if you're putting some pressure and you're judging the time and thinking about the time, that's going to create a lot of struggle. Uh, it's going to put a lot of uh, pressure on her. Um, and so, yeah, if you are interested in her, um, then it's not going to be useful to like, put that kind of like, oh, you've got a message at a certain time or you're late. Mm -mm. No. If you share a message that you want to share with her, and you can celebrate that. Um, it really helped me to shift the focus to giving. So if I give somebody a message, that was the goal. I'm not trying to get a message. I can celebrate giving the message. Thing is, if we're trying to get something, then we often feel like we're lacking. We feel like we want to put pressure on the other person because we want to get something from them. But yeah, what if when you send a message, you're just giving something? You just want to share with her um, and support her and help her celebrate her day. And that's enough. And yeah, if we practice giving, yeah, some other people may also want to give in that relationship. But we don't have to pressure them. Jenny, hello to you. We are also all very excited that you joined the live chat today. Thank you for figuring it out. Nicholas, so your book helped me a lot. I'm really focusing on my life goals, and I am seem to feel better with less intrusive thoughts. Still not fully recovered, but working on it. Oh, Nicholas, it sounds like you are fully recovered. Yeah. We get to just work on those skills um, and grow them. And yeah, you're seeing uh, the results of that, and yeah, enjoy continuing to explore that. Uh, thank you for reading the book and sharing that. Bogos said, would you say that any anxiety disorder is technically OCD? Because you're trying to get rid of a feeling and that's a compulsion. Does that make any sense? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't stick the OCD label, but I would say any, any uh, mental illness disorder is uh, reflective of uh, mental health practices that create poor mental health. Uh, so it's not just anxiety disorders. Um, and so it wouldn't be that, oh, anxiety disorders are all OCD because there are many. Uh, so like the example I often bring up, uh, borderline personality disorder, often if so, so if somebody experiences anxiety around being alone, uh, they may push people away. They may hurt the other person preemptively before they get hurt because of that anxiety of like, what if I'm going to be alone? And so we might label that as borderline personality disorder. But if that person experiences anxiety about being alone, and so they avoid getting into a relationship because they don't want to handle the pain of potentially it ending, and they're very anxious about being alone, and they, like, they do a lot of compulsions to hold on to the person because they're really afraid of getting abandoned. And so because of that anxiety, that person withdraws we'll probably label that as OCD. But see, it was the same. All the label is describing is kind of the direction of the compulsion. One person pushed somebody away. The other person pulled themselves away. But I would see that as the same because they're just reacting to fear of being alone in the way they learned how. Uh, likewise, somebody may... <laughs> you know, react to their fear of being alone by uh, constantly getting drunk when they're around other people. It's very common 
uh, that I hear from people that they've never had sex sober because of anxiety uh, about like relationships, getting abandoned, getting hurt, etc. But again, I would say that's the same thing. Oh no, what if I'm going to be alone? Okay, I've got to get rid of this feeling. I've got to control it somehow. Uh, so yeah, I just look at those are, that's kind of the pattern of poor mental health. Um, and so then based on kind of how we practice that pattern to control and avoid feelings, yeah, we get different, uh, different labels. Uh, but yeah, you can find all sorts of uh, patterns across any diagnosis. Hope. Said, any tips for stopping procrastination, especially when it's because of uncomfortable, urgent feelings? The, so you may find it difficult at first to work with the uncomfortable, urgent feelings. Uh, so there may, it may also be necessary. Uh, like if something's coming up and you, you, know, you really got to get it done, you feel very urgent. So if somebody's in that situation, then often what I'll work with them on is like breaking down the task into really small tasks. Because uh, if when it's really big, or we see it as like I've got to do the whole thing, or our brains have this amazing superpower to see all of the different connections and things that need to happen, which makes it so big we don't start. So breaking it down into really small activities and celebrating those. Uh, so if there's, for instance, if there's some paperwork involved, like just making a task to get out the paperwork and celebrating that, you know, finding all of the different tasks that will make it easy to do the thing you need to do. So that's if there's kind of a thing that needs to get done. But if you want to work on procrastination in general, it helps to start looking at all of the little ways we often procrastinate in everyday life, but just if there's something like we need to do the dishes or something like that, and we're just like, oh, I don't kind of feel like doing it right now, and so we just don't do it. Uh, or we see somebody and we think about saying hi, but we're like, oh, I don't, I don't know if they'll remember me. I just won't do it right now. All of those little ways that we keep avoiding something because of us asking our brains for permission and the brain not giving it. Breaking down that, so finding common ways that you do that in your everyday life and then setting up exercises uh, week by week to break down those patterns. Uh, so yeah, it might be things like, so an exercise I found really useful was uh, at the time I was living in an apartment building and I just kind of set uh, a value of any time I run into somebody in the apartment building, I will say something to them. I will talk to them. And that was, so yeah, useful for working on, like, you could say social anxieties, but also it was really useful because in the past, if I saw somebody, I would immediately start thinking about, oh, they look busy or I don't know them or what am I going to say? Or I would just go to my brain basically to get permission and be like, brain, can we talk to this person? And the brain would be like, no, I can think of 50 million reasons you can't talk to that person. I'd be like, okay. When we procrastinate, that's what we're doing all the time. So yeah, I don't know if you have any ideas about things you regularly do to ask your brain for permission for taking action, but those would be the things to start to break down. Nona said, so a quick question. I get really anxious and panicky around big groups of people, but I used to really love going to festivals. How do I still go and enjoy with all the panic? So actually the question you asked there is a question I would ask you. Uh, what do you like about festivals? How are you going to practice enjoyment? Can you want to practice enjoyment while having any thought or feeling? How are you going to make that a supportive experience for you, but not not needing to say, okay, there can't be a feeling here. So it's actually, I'm going to create the best experience for myself to have panic attacks at a festival. Jenny, I, I have not read the articles, but I hear about them. Um, so yeah, rumination is a compulsion. Like that's a... Um, uh, how to describe this? Yeah, like I have a video on understanding mental compulsions from years ago that, yeah, like a, whether you're checking something and controlling something in your head 
Or outside of your head. Yeah, 100% compulsion. Not, not controversial in any way. Bogus. He said, any book recommendations about anxiety? So this comes back to that idea I was uh, talking about in the beginning. Rather than a book on anxiety, why don't you get a book about something you actually want to keep and grow in your life? David. So there, is there any type of OCD that related to negative emotions and feelings and the fear of sitting with them? I have the belief that if I let go and feel, I will get sucked in and get depression. Yeah, so actually it can really help to recognize there are, there are no types of OCD. Uh, there's just that classic pattern that you're describing there. Um, and even what you're describing there, you could look at as the classic contamination pattern, right? You're afraid of having some kind of contamination, which in this case is an emotion because that's going to cause a bad thing to happen. So you could look at anything we would describe as OCD as just, oh no, what if this bad thing happens and I can't live my life? Um, and so those are just variables. That's why it can, it's really important not to go like searching for somebody with the same uh, fear as me, uh, because anybody's fear is the same. And that compulsion to check and like find uh, like I need to find somebody with the exact same fear is just more of the fear because it's like, oh, if I don't find somebody with the fear, what does that mean? Uh, the brain loves that. Uh, the question then I would ask you is, do you want to learn how to have any feeling while doing the things you really want to do in life? Because um, yeah, if that's something you want to learn, it can be really freeing and uh, it's really useful. Mud, absolutely. Energy in a weird sense is vibrational ideas, totally. Oh, Erica, you said, you mentioned once that you used to think of yourself as really spontaneous and you didn't want to plan things. How can we tell when to stick to our nature or preferences and when we need to try something different, even if it doesn't feel natural or like it suits our personality? It's most of the things that uh, may actually be useful to us will at first feel very wrong and weird and fake. For me, I don't know if you're in, oh my, so in my book, uh, so you're not a rock of the mind workout. That's over, it's over there. Uh, it's too far. I can't grab it right now. The, uh, there's a little drawing I have of like two people with like a rope, um, between them that I often share, uh, it, it was that, it was like really starting to see that I was doing all sorts of things that I thought were me, but then I was really frustrated by where that was taking me. And so it's kind of that awareness, or like the example I was talking about recently, the, the guy who likes jumping in the pool but hates getting wet. So it's starting to see that, right? These things I believe I like doing, are they actually leading me to where I want to be? So I'd say if we're finding ourselves frustrated by where we are, then it's useful to say, oh, well, maybe all these things I think I like, I actually don't like because I don't like the outcome. I don't like where they take me. Uh, and so it is just kind of starting to see that. And then, yeah, once we see that, it's saying, oh, wow, so all of these things I think I don't like uh, and that are fake or not me, actually, I do like them. And so exploring then what that means and like that they are me. Um, but then we often have to learn how to do them. So it is, it is seeing that if the place we want to go is across the lake and we've always said, oh, well, I'm afraid of water because maybe we did have a bad experience with water. It's starting to recognize, oh, okay, actually, yeah, I had a painful experience here, but I want to learn how to enjoy this because the place I want to go is on the other side of that lake. We need it. Ah, so yeah, Renita, you said, I'm very bad at taking criticism and any negativity towards me, what can I do about it? And Renita, you were asking about college earlier, right? Um, if I recall. And so, yeah, this would be an example of the, um, the getting judged uh, by other people, right? 
would you well so actually i won't be able to give you a tip right on that right now because the thing i would ask, like i would have some questions so the thing i would explore around that uh is like why why are you uh afraid of criticism um what is that threatening um could you want to receive criticism uh, and what would it take to want to receive that oh and then the question right after this unprompted mr mitchell hundred says how can you learn to want something you don't want <laughs> the so there's a couple of things so like i was just talking about there with erica uh you may actually want it like you may have started to realize oh my brain throws up these difficult feelings around this thing, but this is the thing I need to learn how to do to go where I want to go. So I, I do actually want to learn how to do that. Uh, so some of it's that, recognizing that. Because uh, again, the brain's so good at throwing up feelings, like just inventing feelings, like it does with contamination. It will feel contaminated even though we're not. So the brain's going to make things feel bad that actually might be really good for us. So there's that, um, so recognizing that. But then what I always bring up with people is uh, if you've ever uh, had any experience of learning how to enjoy a practice you initially disliked, for a lot of people that might be physical fitness. The person who likes going to the gym every day and the person who is getting started at the gym and hates it are having the exact same experience, 100%. It's just one person is going, wow, I'm so sore and I was so sweaty and I, I was rolling around on the floor. That was a great workout. Uh, they're celebrating the same feelings that the person who dislikes it is hating on. So it is partially just making a change of like, do you want to have experiences? That's going to help. Also, uh, finding a goal that's about something you want to grow. Because, uh, yeah, if somebody, say somebody's going to the gym because they're, like, hating on themselves, then, yeah, they're probably going to hate on a whole bunch of other things in the gym, too. But if they're like, I want to I wanna lift more, I want to get stronger, and they have that goal, and they're willing to do difficult things to go after that goal, uh, that can be useful. Because uh, then they can say, okay, I, like, I, I want to have this experience because I know it's helping me move towards the thing I want to grow. Mike, thanks for joining us a second time. Marlos said, how to take other people less serious? I've noticed I take everything someone else says as true. I would like to trust myself, and I know it ties in with low self-esteem. Yeah, Marlos, what if um, instead of uh, starting with other people, yeah, would you, because you're bringing up trust there, I assume, is it that if you believe something or you like something, you quickly discard it if you hear somebody else say something. Uh, so if it's something like that, an exercise that I found really helpful was to start to share about what I liked and to give time and energy to you know, talking about what I like, telling other people about what I like, and, and just celebrating that. Because we've kind of got to start to show the brain, hey, like, the things I uh, care about matter and I want to share them with others. Man, other people can do with that whatever they want. Because, uh, yeah, the great thing is, if you're sharing that stuff, somebody may say something negative about it. And being able to have that and go, oh, okay, that person doesn't like this. I like it. And leave it at that. Because, yeah, the brain will be really worried that means something. But, yeah, you get to say, no, I really care about these things. I want to celebrate them. And other people can do whatever they want. Hello, hello. He said, I've been struggling to work on core fears. I think I have both a fear of being judged and a fear of losing my identity. Okay. But I can't think of any compulsions I do that keep this going other than big single ruminations. Uh, well, hello, hello. So if somebody brought the so fear of being judged, I'd be curious, uh, do you do anything around other people to control things? Also, if you're being judged, I'd always ask, like, are you sharing the things you want to share 
with the world? Or do you hold back because, oh, like, what if somebody criticized my work? What if somebody left a negative comment? Any things like that? Um, so, because the reason I think of that is because you also mentioned identity there. So usually if somebody has fear of being judged and their fear of losing their identity, the thing I'd want to know is how are you expressing your identity? How are you practicing being yourself in the world? Because, uh, yeah, why is it that the brain is afraid of you losing it? if you're out there practicing it. Uh, so yeah, if there's anything you really want to be sharing with the world that you've been avoiding, I'd start there. Kevin, yeah, he said, how would you drop internal body scanning for panic symptoms? This is my biggest compulsion. When I go into situations, I scan my body, which I believe causes the symptoms I'm looking for. Yes, 100%, you see it. This is how you give yourself a panic attack is to start checking in your body for things that are wrong. Inevitably, you're going to find something that's wrong. That's going to start some anxiety. Brain goes into fight or flight mode. And then you're checking that and you're like, oh no, there is something else wrong here. And it just, they just ladder up and they go. Uh, so part of it's, yeah, going to be setting that goal. So one, wanting to have panic attacks. So if you want to have panic attacks, there's no need to scan for them because you want them to be there, so they're just gonna do their thing, that's great. When you notice yourself checking, because you probably do it automatically, uh, actually having something else you wanna give your attention to. So you can say, oh, like, oh, I see that brain, I know you're checking for panic attacks. I wanna have panic attacks though, like this place we're going to, I hope I have a spectacular, explosive panic attack, uh, like on this airplane. I want everybody on the airplane to be like jumping out of the exits because my panic attack is so extreme. But brain right now, I actually wanna notice uh, this movie I'm watching or I wanna enjoy this food I'm eating right now or I'm gonna give my attention to this person who's talking about something ridiculous because I wanna risk giving my attention to something pointless when there's a terrible panic attack about to happen. So the brain will want us to like focus on the feelings to make sure we're okay. So it's a, you know, a kind of classic, big, scary ERP exercise to give our attention to living. We're going to give our attention to living instead of fixing the problem uh, and celebrate that. And so, yeah, by doing that, we start to show the brain, oh, panic attacks are no longer this thing we're going to protect and control. Um, and then it starts to learn it doesn't have to check for them. Jen said, I'm hung up on whether a parent is having memory issues and I watch them all the time for possible signs of dementia. How can I stop noticing and ruminating on every little thing they do? So one of the things that can be useful uh, with you know, family and any, anybody we care about, uh, I, I find it helpful to look at what you want to give Noticing that that, you know, that desire, that uh, pressure to protect them, to get that certainty, it comes from a place of caring about them. But then doing all of those compulsions to constantly be checking and monitoring and judging, it's just going to get exhausting. Um, and it'll take you away from enjoying uh, your time with them. And so, yeah, when you notice that, it can be okay to, hey, notice how much you care, um, you know, notice hey, brain, of course we want to check on this right now. Uh, but here's what I want to give to my family member. And I'm just going to enjoy giving that. Um, I don't have to do that checking right now. But yeah, if, you know, if you're working with a therapist or somebody, one of the things you could explore around that is, yeah, like what, what are those really difficult feelings you're trying to kind of get control and certainty of by getting that reassurance? Um, cause yeah, we are just trying to get that reassurance, get that stability, but then of course we create so much anxiety by chasing that. Um, but yeah, if we can work a bit on those difficult feelings, that can often help us. And not that we have to get rid of them, it's just to notice them. Be like, yeah, I'm really worried about my family member. Mike, 
So this is about the messaging. We said, how would you approach a situation in which only I am making the effort to reach out? We spoke about the insecurity it causes me and that he is not hinting on leaving him alone. I can't help but still feeling like I'm burdening him when I reach out because he doesn't want to really interact with me. The, yeah, I'm, I'm not, it sounds like there's all sorts of uh, uh, factors and information that you know, can't fit in uh, the small message on YouTube. So I'm not totally clear on the situation. The, when you say like, I still feel like I'm burdening him when I reach out because he doesn't really, doesn't want to really interact with me. So yeah, I mean, if, if somebody said they don't want to interact with you, uh, yeah, I'd look at, is there a particular reason you want to keep interacting with them? The reason I bring that up um, is because also sometimes we, it, we might be putting ourselves in like difficult situations, hard work. So yeah, maybe I'll bring, something I always talk about is how uh, our brains love hard work. So where maybe somebody else would like to hear from us uh, and would really like to communicate with us, but will will choose to communicate, you know, with the kind of like the cat in the house that doesn't want to interact with anybody. And we're like, no, like I'm going to prove to everybody that that cat likes people. Well, they at least that cat likes me. And we're just trying to get that affection. Sometimes, yeah, we've had difficult experiences with affection, so we're also like looking for this kind of like big hit of, okay, the person who doesn't like me, now they like me, I'm safe. Uh, and so, yeah, there might be a, a many different things to explore in the situation. I don't really know what the situation is, um, but yeah, just exploring for ways that um, uh, we can grow and nourish relationships that uh, are nourishing to us uh, it can be really valuable. Ryan said, I'm trying to remove my judgment for everything in life, but my brain's feeling very dangerous when I live without judgment at all. Is recommended to turn out the judgment function. Yeah, Ryan, can you explain exactly what you mean? Because I wouldn't, I, would, I mean, judgment is a superpower. Uh, it's incredible that we have this, this like nuclear fusion powered label maker in our brains that like can instantly uh, like quantum computing style, even put judgments on things that don't even exist in the past and the future simultaneously, total quantum physics kind of stuff. But we got to learn how to use it. So that just the way that you're describing I don't know if you caught the discussion about the monk that went, like was really intensely, I'm gonna go meditate so hardcore in the mango grove um, that like, I'm gonna live without judgment. I'm cutting out judgments over everything in life. That sounds a bit rigid and extreme. Uh, yeah, what if it, things can be a bit easier? Bogos said, by the way, I went to a skate park recently, and then there were a lot of people there, and I pushed myself to join in and skate, not fearing of what others would think of me. I had some people talk to me, and they were unexpectedly very social with me. I met a kid, and she was so amazing, very extroverted. It was fun talking to her, and she loved talking to me too. I will never forget that day. Hey, that's great. You went and joined in with the community. Naveen. I said, which part of Earth are you currently in? I'm in a good part. Oh, it's, it's very beautiful here. James, he said, with intrusive thoughts, you just need to let them be there and carry on with what you value. But when they're really intense about something bad happening, any advice on how to carry on? So one thing, that can really help is, is knowing in advance what carrying on means. Uh, so having really simple actions that we're measuring success by so that we can say, wow, it's really intense right now, right? Cause like 
I'm in a full-blown panic attack. It feels like my brain is peeling off the inside of my skull. There's all sorts of weird physical sensations. Brain's running through every possible horrible intrusive thought just to get my attention. But all I need to do today is eat breakfast and go and talk to a person I care about. That's all I'm doing today. So I want to bring this experience along to breakfast and then to talk to that person I care about. That's all I value. So having those really clear, simple values helps us make space for that difficult experience. So that's one thing. Uh, it was mentioned earlier about, yeah, intrusive thoughts, ruminating. They're all just a bunch of compulsions in our head. So yeah, when somebody says I'm having an intense experience, I like to ask them, like, how did that intense experience happen? Because if we look at what happened before that intense experience and how you're interacting with it, we're probably going to see a lot of compulsions. But we may see them as normal and necessary. A lot of judging, a lot of controlling, a lot of checking. And then that creates an intense experience. Uh, so yeah, both, yeah, we want to help ourselves have intense experiences, but also it's useful to look at what's creating them. And it's very likely it's a bunch of internal compulsions and external compulsions too. But uh, so yeah, we do both. We learn how to have them and we learn how to prevent them. As Mina, as Mirna, I'm trying to stop compulsions, but it's been so hard. I feel like I do it just to get rid of them. For example, I try to stop rumination, but the harder I try it, it gets worse. Yeah. So again, brain loves hard work. Let's go, let's go like super hard on cutting out rumination. But so much of rumination is just trying to control things and fix things and check things in our head. So actually going hard on it uh, tends to teach the brain to like throw up even more stuff to ruminate on. Because it goes, oh, you like fixing ruminate? ruminating? Great, here's more stuff to ruminate. Uh, it really helped me to see that it's about letting it be easy. Even cutting out rumination, I would describe as being lazy. Because we're doing so much hard work in our heads, right? When we're ruminating, we are time traveling, we are controlling multiple timelines uh, in multiple universes. We're controlling what other people think. Like the number of superpowers we believe we have in our heads is astounding. We can time travel, we can control what other people think, uh, we can uh, pre like prevent bad things from happening in the universe. It's amazing. So much work. Be lazy. So laziness is about the brain throwing up an uncertainty, which in the past we might have started ruminating on. Going, like, huh? Yeah, that's a that's a big uncertainty. I don't I don't know what's gonna happen with that. And then be lazy. And so it's actually gonna be about doing less. So I had shared in a recent video uh, that acceptance is an undoing. So it's not a thing we need to do. It's about undoing all of those compulsions. So like, like I was just talking about there with an intense experience. We don't need to do all of that checking and controlling around stuff in our heads. We can be lazy. Ah, Erica, yes, and I find the approach of creating super concrete goals. Like anytime I see someone in my building, I will say something to them. So helpful. Yeah, I found those because also you can see it takes, speaking of ruminating, it takes out all of the should I, like what do I value, like should I do a thing here. Again, it's making it really easy and lazy. Like, yep, yeah, it's a person, so I say something to them. We're not, we're not even going to debate it. Fati. He said, I have too much anxiety. Still, it continues. I don't know what I can do with this. It's about my 15 to 24 year old. Uh, I was isolated. What is the process of this? Um, so, Paddy, are you talking about when you were 15 to 24 years old, that you have a lot of anxiety about it, or that you have kids who are 15 to 24 years old and you worry about them? Either of those, though. Uh, yeah, it's really going to be about shifting the focus to something you want to grow. And at first, it'll feel wrong. 
Or it's going to be like, why are you ignoring this anxiety? Something bad is going to happen. But actually, you can give your time and energy to the things you really care about uh, and grow them. And then that becomes the exercise because actually when the brain throws up that worry and we give it our attention and try to control it, we are teaching the brain to be anxious about it. We're telling it that it's something dangerous. So the brain goes, oh, okay, like, they keep trying to fix and control this. It must be bad. I will keep worrying about it. And so we need to start showing the brain it's not uh, this dangerous thing anymore. My downward spiral is how, how am I doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. Taj said, I can't really tell if my body twitches or voluntary or involuntary. Should I focus on trying to cut it out? Because, oh, oh, I wonder, I don't see another message, Taj. If I go away, no, I don't see one. So we're just gonna have to hang on the because. I hope it was like, because if I don't twitch, our universe will be destroyed. Okay, so, although we just talked about there are multiple universes and timelines, so you don't have to worry about that that much. However, it is not an easy thing to answer. And that's it, because yeah, the, when it comes to the physical twitches and stuff, they can often feel very involuntary. They can happen very automatically like reflexes. At the same time, you can explore learning how to not do them. And so it's something to yeah, explore with gentleness and kindness, not hating on them, not trying to control them. It's often about learning how to sit in uncomfortable feelings and not fix and control. So an exercise I often give to people to start exploring this is to uh, sit. So th and there's a video on my YouTube channel about this. It's called the Curiosity Meditation. Um, is to yeah, sit, to meditate, and not move. And so you start with a very short period of time. It doesn't take long, especially when you first sit down to meditate, for your body to go, oh, like your foot's in the wrong spot, or ooh, there's an itch here. And then just practice noticing that feeling and not reacting to it, but instead being curious about it. So especially if somebody has also like sensory motor OCD symptoms, this can be a great place to start. So just starting to explore how we interact with physical sensations. It's things that feel very automatic. As we start to explore them, we can actually start to get ahead of them and change how we interact with them. Uh, but also when we do react to them automatically, yeah, being kind to that. Uh, the, the brain is just trying to save time and energy by reacting. Oh, no, no, this is wonderful. Nona says, uh, I now will be on a mission to create a guide on how to have a perfect panic attack at a festival. I look forward to reading it. I just started uh, over the weekend. I had to change countries. And so I took a flight. And uh, I was, I'm recording a video. Uh, it might take another couple of weeks before I get all the footage, but on uh, how to have a panic attack on a plane. Uh, so uh, yeah, I look forward to your, <clears throat> excuse me, guide on how to have panic attacks at festivals. Together, hey everybody, if we all make a bunch of guides on how to have panic attacks, we can have a lot of really spectacular panic attacks in the world. Viora said, I'm on vacationing right now and it's been rough. My anxiety spikes and I have terrible intrusive thoughts. I watched your video about them. Sometimes it's so hard to just accept them. Yeah, it is, it is hard to accept them. And often, especially with a vacation, we've been doing a lot of compulsions, excuse me, before the vacation. And so when we get on the vacation, it's very difficult because we've been doing all sorts of compulsions leading up to the vacation. And then we're there and the brain's like, okay, let's keep going. And we're like, no, no, we don't have to. We're on vacation now. But the brain doesn't get that. So, yeah, when you're on vacation, it's useful to you know, not have to put a lot of pressure on yourself to uh, you know, be accepting some intrusive thoughts or something like that. Because also, when we're in a new place, uh, our brains will often react to uncertainty of a new place by throwing up old intrusive thoughts we have experience controlling. 
There is, so I have a mental health and travel blog called the mindfulfieldguide.com. There is a travel and mental health uh, section on there, um, which I think is at the top. If you go to the URL, it's at the top of the page. So the mindfulfieldguide.com. There might be some articles there that might uh, be useful. S. <clears throat> I think there's like something stuck in my throat. I said, how to understand studying related compulsions and stop comparing ourselves with others, our progress, our life, everything. Yeah, because that comparing is going to create a lot of struggle and suffering. So one of the things you can do, because uh, yeah, if you recognize that the comparing is not useful to you. Yeah, it can really help to pick some values that are just about things you give. It's this that switch I have to talk about from getting to giving. So if you're doing all that comparing, you're probably trying to get a bunch of stuff. Um, to instead look at, you know, in the, the week ahead, what do you want to give? And when you notice the brain running off to compare, bringing it back to what you want to give to yourself or to others and just celebrating that. So, because it's got to be, we have to stop engaging with it. If the brain throws up, oh no, that person has this, other, that person has a dozen donuts and you only have one donut. And then we're like, oh, why do I only have one donut? If you engage with it, yeah, then it's going to keep getting worse and worse. Uh, but if the brain goes, well, that person has a dozen donuts and you only have one donut. And you're like, yeah, I really like my one donut. Then it's not going to get worse and worse. Especially if like, you really enjoy the donut that you're having. Uh, maybe even you just give that donut to somebody else. Then it can be very enjoyable. Mundo said, I've had a stressful time and I've been wasting energy on my anger and paranoia instead of ruminating. Mm, that sounds like ruminating. <laughs> I hate myself when I get this way and wish myself to be OCD again. Yeah, so and then you're saying, is this a cycle of OCD? I don't understand the, the differentiation you're making there. Uh, yeah, you, like, to go back to that, I don't know if you caught it earlier, the, like, forget a label like OCD or anxiety, paranoia, whatever, spending time on things you don't wanna be spending time on, spending time like controlling and hating and fixing on things, that's just going to lead to poor mental health. What label you want to stick on that? Irrelevant. Uh, yeah, it's really looking at great mental health. That's going to be about giving time and energy to things you want to grow and build and give. And so, yeah, regardless of the, how you're labeling the thing you dislike, building great mental health and fitness is going to be the same. I'm going to said, I've been in recovery, you put recovery in quotation marks, but I have spirals when bad external situations happen and a new fear and stress. And, and so I mean, I'm going to assume you're asking about given that external situations happen with new fears, how can I bake more donuts? This is a classic uh, question, comes up often. There are a couple things that I find helpful here. So one, uh, I'll, so I'll often describe it as a kind of natural journey on taking care of our mental health, that we go from learning how to handle internal disruption to external disruption. So it sounds like you're at that point to explore that. And so it's going to be exploring that as a practice, probably the same way you approached whatever you're defining as recovery as an internal exploration. So it is saying, wow, you know what? I care about baking donuts. I want to learn how to bake donuts in turbulent waters. I want to learn how to bake donuts. Uh, well, there's a pack of lions uh, running around me. Really going after those things you want to create and wanting to have the kind of the obstacle and disruption. Um, at the same time, you don't really have to pursue that just by going after the thing you care about. Life, as you've noticed, will naturally provide external situations. 
Um, so yeah, I'd be really curious about what you want to create. Um, it might not be donuts. Uh, it can be. Uh, but yeah, what's your donut? And yeah, how do you want to do that more? Um, and really exploring, how do you want to do that well? And as you move towards that, wanting to handle whatever comes up. Because um, yeah, life will supply uh, lots of disruptions. My downward spiral. He said, if there is technically no intrusive thoughts, then does OCD come from our reactions and fixations on the thoughts? Uh, so I'd, I'd go broader, right, than just thoughts. But yeah, it, it, OCD is 100% just the reaction and interaction uh, with experiences that we judge as unwanted. Right? So whether it's a feeling of contamination, we're like, I've got to clean it away. Or it's a thought you judge as contaminated, and you're like, I've got to clean it away. Um, it's the cleaning away, not the experience. Oh, hi all. said, I'm actually going through hell, the best bit of recovery. But you have, I think that's a roller coaster there, right? Absolutely. A crown, a sparkling crown, and a roller coaster. Ride that roller coaster. And so even then, it's about seeing how do you want to support yourself on the roller coaster? Because yeah, absolutely, there are so many weird, wild things that happen when we're making useful changes. But still really asking that question, how do I make this easy for myself? How do I support myself? Uh, yeah, because yeah, we're doing, you're doing challenging work. Um, so it's okay to make it easy. It's okay to support yourself through that. Marlos said, what has been the biggest help for you in your mental fitness journey? Has your goals changed since starting on your mental fitness journey? Sure, I think it's, it's great to you know, see our values and our goals can change all of the time and even to regularly look at them because we are just wandering through the wilderness. So it's as we discover more of the wilderness, we can say like, oh, where do I want to go next? Like, I want to go say hello to that tree over there or I didn't know there was a lake here. Oh, like maybe let's camp out by the lake for a while because it's really nice. And so, yeah, all, all of the time our, our values and goals can change. Um, and that's really useful. To so the question of what's the most useful uh, help on the mental fitness journey, uh, yeah, I think you know it's it's something I talk about all the time. But yeah, wanting to have any thought or feeling. It's like going into the gym. Like if we look at physical fitness, like wanting to lift any weight, wanting to do any exercise. But if we're like, ah, I just really hope the gym is easy today. I hope somebody got rid of all the weights. I hope they're, oh, I hope we're not like doing any Olympic lifting. Like, oh, I hope we don't do anything with ropes. Like, yeah, if your approach is like, I hope there's nothing useful there, uh, then we really struggle. But if we want to go and be curious, uh, we want to go and explore, then it can make things much easier. Bogos said, why does magical thinking even exist if it doesn't make any sense at all? Does that have to do with childhood memories and experiences? Is this some sort of belief system that our parents made us believe? Uh, well, no, I think magical thinking is a kind of a very natural human reaction to trying to bring control and order to an uncertain world and universe. Uh, right, our brains are you know, kind of set up to try to make sense of the world, but then or it often doesn't make sense, but then the brain doesn't like that. So it's often, right, like say something bad happens and the brain goes, well, why did it happen? Oh, you, you didn't touch the special good light switch today. Oh no, you caused the bad thing to happen. Like the, the brain is just looking to make sense of the world. And that's, that's probably kind of just how it's designed because that's really helpful to us. For instance, putting together language. We learn language because we learn, oh, if I say this thing, it leads to a thing that I want. Uh, same reason even, you know, like when um, dogs pick up words and things like that. Oh, that's usually because it's associated with some kind of reward or punishment. Um, and yeah, when you look at magical thinking, yeah, usually it's reward or punishment. Jay Jordan, he said, advice on intrusive thoughts being more annoying during recovery. I accept they are there and try not to judge them. 
but they're really annoying, especially whilst having a peaceful day. So, Jay, I would suggest that you are the one annoying them. They would love to be left alone. But if you keep hating on them, you keep telling them, you guys are so annoying, checking on them, looking at them, judging them. Yeah, what if you left them alone? Also, uh, expect as you're cutting out compulsions, that the brain is going to throw up the intrusive thoughts because it's accustomed to you annoying them. And so it doesn't know why you're not trying to control and hate and fix on the old thoughts. So yeah, it's going to give you the ones that you most consistently play with. And they, yeah, you may see them as the most annoying ones. Um, but yeah, the brain, so I describe it right as the brain, like throwing sticks, like weird, like the brain's pet and the brain is like, how do I amuse my pet? So the brain's constantly throwing stuff at you. And then some of the stuff you grab onto it and annoy it. Uh, and the brain goes, all right, I guess they like playing with that stuff. I'll throw more of it. So we've got to cut out the playing with the stuff the brain throws up. Yeah, can you want it to throw all of that stuff and you are not going to touch it? Uh, and then Ryan said, related to this, if we learn how to learn to want something we don't want, what next? Uh, but it was never just about that. It was always about, like we were talking earlier about the donut. Uh, yeah, like don't make it about just like, I, I'm going to want to have this thing I hate. That's not the goal. The goal is doing the things you really want to do in life on the way to doing the things you want to do in life, it's useful to want any kind of disruption, any kind of thought or feeling, any kind of weather. But it's so important to make it about where you want to go. The accepting something we dislike is never the goal. It's only something we do on the way to being ourselves in the world and giving the things we want to give. Asmirna, he said, what do you recommend to stop hyper-focusing on feelings and thoughts? The more I try to not hyper-focus, the more I do it. Yeah, so I, like, I would have a bunch of questions like that. Like if you're working with a skilled professional, exploring like, what's going to happen if you don't focus on that stuff? Like what are you trying to control? Uh, what's the fear there? Like what, what are you trying to get? There would be a bunch of things to explore. And then based on that, probably see some uh, changes you could make that be useful. Hi, is it oh, right now I'm the number one trending topic uh, at Twitter Turkey. Normally I would freak out trying to sit with the emotions given that criticism is one of my biggest contamination feelings. Yeah, hi, like that sitting in that uh, are we're so right sensitive to that. And that's that's why though, as you see, like, you see that you can sit in that and then it's finding those supports that are really going to help you right now. And yeah, the brain's going to want to go check stuff. It's going to want to go look at stuff. It's going to want to go see, are we still the number one trending? Are people still looking at us? But really making it about what's going to be nourishing to you. What's going to be helpful to you today? And still though, there'll be that sense of like soaking in that hot spring bath. But what's going to really support you? Yeah. So, yeah, take care of yourself and support yourself today. Mr. Mitchell Hundred. Oh, actually, I'm going to continue because I see how you left another message down below. You said, yeah, right now my brain is obsessed on don't chase relief, don't feel good, the feelings is not real, be sad. It's like a weightlifting obsession. Yeah, what do I suggest? So actually, it's great you brought this up because I was just thinking about this too. So yeah, watch, that's what I was mentioning, it's okay to support yourself and care for yourself. You don't have to push on something, uh, right? Because life is gonna take care of throwing up enough disruptions, enough difficult experiences. So when life is already doing that, we don't have to go, okay, I'm gonna like push into it more. This is like the story in my book of the kid who uh, stays in the tiger cage because he heard, oh, I heard it's bad to avoid fears. 
and I'm scared the tiger is going to eat me. Yeah, the tiger ate him. Doing uh, what we value, supporting ourselves in what we want to grow, caring for ourselves, that's got to be number one. It's not about like, oh, I've got I've to go have this bad feeling now and I've got to push into it. No, it's, it's okay to uh, support ourselves and nourish ourselves. Our brains tend to have, it seems, lack the kind of cutoff where we would say, oh, I've done enough or I'm pushing too far. And so really having that understanding of, hey, like, yeah, there's some difficult experiences happening right now. Okay. How do I want to support myself? I don't, I don't have to get into the tiger cage to like prove that I'm not afraid of tigers. I can just go and see something else in the zoo that I really want to celebrate and enjoy. And that could be enough. Uh, so yeah, being able to see like, yeah, you're doing the workout. You've done a good workout. You can see you've done enough. And now what do you want to enjoy? Mr. Mitchell 100, so as this, you get to kind of see the discussion in the chat. So Mr. Mitchell 100 said, can I apply wanting what I don't want to stuff like dying? Because I don't want to die, LOL. To which Mud said, the answer will probably be yes. Uh, yeah, the answer is yes. But it's, but I would go after uh, following up on what Heil was just talking about. I describe it as keeping death close. It doesn't mean we have to like want death. But we can recognize that death can be very, very close. It could be tomorrow. So being able to say, okay, like, well, if I'm going to die tomorrow, do I want to spend today on a bunch of compulsions? If I'm going to die next week, do I want to spend this week on a bunch of compulsions? Um, but I also don't have to spend the rest of the week hating on the fact that I might die next week or die tomorrow. Yeah, I really am going to be with the things I care about and celebrate those and give to those and enjoy those. So yeah, just like we were just talking about, we don't have to go on some like, okay, I'm going to go like face death and I'm not going to avoid the fear. No, because then we're just doing the compulsions. Right? The brain just wants us and to play with it. It's not really about the fear. So we see it there. We're like, yeah, like, being judged by others is really scary. Death is really scary. Okay. And what am I going to do today that really cares for me and my garden? And then I'm going to practice that and nourish that. But yeah, we can do that with an awareness of uh, death can be very, very close. And I, I want to handle that experience. So maybe that's a different way of approaching the wanting part. I want to do the things I care about while recognizing I could die tomorrow. Kimberly said, I believe you mentioned giving to ourselves what we need rather than seeking it from others. How do we differentiate what should come from within us versus from others? Mm -hmm. So see, it is an exploration because it's not, it's not like a clear-cut thing. Um, but what I would look at there, for instance, if we notice we're constantly trying to get validation from others or we're afraid to be alone. And so we're constantly needing to be with others. So then it might be really useful to explore spending time alone. Explore how do I give myself validation. As a exploration of curiosity. I often like to call them festivals of curiosity. It doesn't mean we have to only be alone, but it's more about learning that we can do both. And so by exploring those things that we've been avoiding, then we start to see, oh, okay, here are the situations where actually I can do things alone. And here are the situations where I really enjoy doing things with others, not because I need to do things with others, but because I really enjoy that, I actually want to support others. And I'm going to even change how I do those social interactions. So for instance, I noticed, uh, I, you know, I really wanted you know, the validation of maybe somebody asking me to go and do a social thing or 
uh, you know, I, was, I would be checking, like, oh, nobody's, you know, invited me to do something. So I, you know, place a lot of importance on that. But then I was never inviting other people to do things. Like, I saw it as a very, like, I also, like, oh, I'd be a burden if I asked other people to do things. Because that kind of, like, oh, I, they probably don't want to do anything with me. So then I'm just waiting for them to ask me. Uh, so the big switch was to start to invite people to do things. Because to realize, oh, I like doing things with people, so why don't I create the situation to do that? Um, and so it's things like that. So enjoy exploring that. And then, yeah, seeing what are those things you want to do with others and what uh, can you actually do on your own? Neem said, I have this ritual where I'll write a resolution down and then strike a match perfectly to confirm it. Afterwards, I'll doubt if I did. But regardless, the resolution still exists. So simply move into it. Uh, yes, and cut out the compulsion. Your pens are welcome. Joseph. Oh, thank you for joining us for this uh, live session. Oh, you said, I've been able to do a lot more ever since I found this challenge. Hey, congratulations. I'm glad, uh, really glad it's been a resource for doing more. Congratulations to you on taking this resource and uh, turning it into action. Viola, yeah, you asked, this is following up on the vacation. You said, why does my anxiety spike on a vacation? I was more or less managing it before I left. Oh, now it's gotten pretty bad. Hoping it will get better. Ooh, ooh, okay. So we're also managing it. So I always say that managing anxiety is cultivating anxiety. So yeah, if you were managing anxiety before a vacation, I would actually look at that as causing it to spike on the vacation because a vacation is usually in a place where there's more uncertainty. Uh, it's a new place. There's lots of things you don't control. You're out of your regular routine. So it's normal for intrusive thoughts and anxiety to increase in places where there's increased uncertainty. If in the lead up to the vacation, you're doing lots of things to like manage anxiety, which usually means like avoiding feelings, controlling feelings, right? So like controlling things and getting certainty. That means that when you hit the vacation and there is more uncertainty, the brain's just gonna explode because suddenly it's like, whoa, this is all different. Why, why are things different? How are we going to control them? I've got to give you things to control because you like managing anxiety. So yeah, I'd really, like I was mentioning before, I'd really look at what happens before a trip or as Mud pointed out, brains love travel. Elvod. Said, outside of healing mental illness, what are the other practical benefits of practicing meditation? Whoa, whoa, what type of meditation is your favorite? Whoa. So meditation is not about fixing anything. Uh, so I do uh, you know, practice uh, meditation in a Zen tradition, usually the Soto Zen, uh, but in Zen in general, message that gets hit home all the time to approach meditation with no gaining idea. And yeah, if you're approaching meditation as this like thing to fix other stuff, it's going to create all sorts of challenges. And then, yeah, you might actually not meditate because either you'll be like, oh, I meditated to get rid of anxiety. I'm not anxious today. I don't need to meditate. Uh, or You'd be like, oh, I, I thought I was going to meditate to get rid of intrusive thoughts. But when I sit down to meditate, I have so many intrusive thoughts. So, yeah, if you try to use meditation as a compulsion, expect more problems. Meditation is really useful to explore for the sake and outcome of meditating. The goal, the benefit is that you meditated. You got to be you. It's the most amazing thing. So many of our fears about some kind of disruption, taking away the opportunity to be ourselves, us losing control of ourselves, losing control of our lives. So when we sit, we get to be. We're ourselves. That is the only thing we're ever chasing. And in that moment, we get to be there. So there is nothing else that we needed to do. 
Hi, Elk. So what do you think about compulsively trying to be positive and optimistic all the time? Checking if I love myself enough, if I love life enough, if my outlook on life is positive enough. Yeah, so I find that it can, one, be exhausting uh, because it's like if we, yeah, we want to be enough of something, our brains then always doubt it. Like they'll always find something that's not quite positive enough, that's not quite loving enough. So then it just becomes this way kind of to punish ourselves. So I find instead of needing to get something, just looking at what we want to give to ourselves. So even if we're like having a tough day, like say we're like, oh, like this sucks. We don't have to be like, no, you should be positive right now. But what we can be positive about is giving love to ourselves in that moment and giving compassion to ourselves. So I find it's, it's more like being able to touch the difficult feeling. Say, okay, like, I don't need to change that feeling, but I, I really want to care for myself right now. I really want to give to myself right now. Like, one of the ways you can do it is see that difficult feeling as a younger you. So if there was, say that was a 12-year-old girl, that was a 12-year-old you, when you were 12, and she was having a difficult time, you wouldn't tell her, like, you're not being positive enough. What would you want to give to her? How could you be positive to her while also making space for the difficult feeling that she's having? Amina, they said, I fear putting myself out there online, LinkedIn, Insta. I feel like I'm a failure compared to my peers at my age. My brain stops me from outside judgment, but not having social stops growth. Yeah, so this is, like I was talking about earlier, I find it so useful to look at how are we not expressing ourselves? How are we not being ourselves in the world? Because, like I was just saying, that's the thing we most want to do. And so if we're avoiding being ourselves, what tends to happen is that the brain obsesses even more about losing control of ourselves, about being judged by others, because we're not doing the thing we want to be doing because of a fear. So we're essentially giving up control of our life to some brain weather. It's terrifying to the brain. <laughs> the brain then worries even more about things that could take away control. So yeah, it's, over there's like, you hear right about, you know, social media being, you know, terrible and so on. And absolutely, we can use social media to do all sorts of compulsions. But I find uh, with clients, I often end up working more on learning how to have a social media profile and do it in a healthy way because they actually do have things they want to share with people. But then they're avoiding that sharing. They're not giving the things they want to give, which then makes them feel like they're not being themselves. Um, so yeah, often uh, I think I'll, I'll work out people with more like learning how to have a profile picture of themselves, learning how to share pictures of themselves, learning how to share their work, but in a way that's about giving and not doing a bunch of compulsions. The, um, and so mention, I should mention one thing though, because I, I was just talking about working with people, but uh, at the moment, uh, so my coaching practice is full. Um, and probably will be full for uh, a couple months. So I have started an Instagram subscription channel, uh, which you can find if you just go to my Instagram, which is Mark W. Freeman. And the idea, the way that the Instagram subscription channel is different, uh, yeah, is because often what I'll share on kind of the main feed is, uh, I would say like easier content, like it's uh, accessible to many people. What I'm sharing in the subscription channel is like more detailed posts and really, so there is the assumption that like if somebody is subscribing, they are working on skills. So the content is, is more like, kind of like making pages of a resource, right? So, cause you can save and things like that so that people can kind of take an image. So often the images will either have like a lot more text um, explaining mental fitness concepts, or it'll be like a reel. Uh, so there's more videos on there, but so that somebody can really put together a resource cause they're working on things. Uh, and yeah, that's to also create a more accessible option. Um, cause yeah, one-on-one -on -one coaching can get expensive 
and it's limited by how many right, Zoom calls I can do during a day. So the idea is that that's really kind of a asynchronous support group for people working on big changes and mental fitness skills. Uh, so yeah, if that's something you'd be interested in, check that out. Um, if you have any questions about it, send me a message. Uh, I just started two weeks ago. So, or no, even a week ago maybe? Yeah, like last week. So it's, it's been two weeks. Uh, so yeah, there's not a ton of content up, but there's uh, <clears throat> somewhere I think I've posted uh, every day and that's kind of the plan. There'll be some times where I can't post every day. But yeah, if you wanna dig more deeply into stuff, that's something to check out. Mike, so to give more clarity on the previous question, the person has reassured me a few times, yes, compulsion, that they want me in their life, but only I seem to be making efforts to reach out. So I'm stuck. So actually, yeah, Mike, I don't see why you're stuck. Why not just reach out when you wanna reach out? And you don't have to ask them for reassurance anymore. Amy, hi. He said, I'm stuck in flight or fight. My nervous system is pretty much in protection mode. Mm. So it's doing a good job. I had a panic attack a few months ago that left me with high anxiety. Do you have any tips? Uh, so, so here's a great example. See how you detailed a whole bunch of things you don't like? All of my tips would be about the things you do like. So this is a thing we'll often do that leads to a lot of struggling. We'll just go... We'll see the issue as a bunch of things we hate, but actually the issue is how do I do the things I love and care about? And so start with those. So any tips I have would be, uh, so for instance, uh, let's see, if you said like the thing I really care about is connection with other people and building social relationships. So then we look at, okay, so you probably want to organize some social events. You want to invite some people out. So how are we going to invite people out or go to some social events? Well, having any thought or feeling, but it's going to be about what are those simple goals you want to practice at the social event? What are the things you want to give? Not I've got to fix anxiety and panic attacks because the I want to fix anxiety and panic attacks is what's gonna create more panic attacks. So it's gotta be about like, where do you wanna go? How do we go there? Uh, and then that is uh, how we actually go there. Hi, Ellen. You said, I think not judging also became a cleaning compulsion. Totally, it happens all the time. Like gaslighting myself. Yeah, for example, if I don't like someone, no, no, I like them, they are great. Oh yeah, yeah, no, so key with judgment and non-judgment Non-judgment is seeing things as they are. So, yeah, if, if we're like, that person is not great, that, just, that might be, like, I was just recognize, oh yeah, like they, they are not great. Actually, I recognize I don't have to spend time hating on them in my head, but I see that I'm not going to spend time with them. Let's move on to who I do want to spend time with. So yeah, it's not about pretending something is a way it's not. Uh, non-judgment, when we get past the judgments, it actually helps us see the way things are. Uh, and so the, the, how I often describe this to people, because it's yeah, very common that we get hooked on, okay, I can't judge anything. Uh, I describe it as putting cookies in, or no, putting rocks in cookies. That's not about like, oh, I'm going to accept rocks in cookies. No, rocks don't go in cookies. Those aren't good cookies. I'm not gonna spend time hating on that. If somebody wants to put rocks in cookies, go for it. But I am not going to make cookies that way. And I, the fact is, the way they're making cookies, that's also not gonna be delicious and they're probably gonna have a really expensive dentist bill. And that's just a fact. Uh, and so non-judgment doesn't mean ignoring facts. Rocks don't go in cookies. How do we make a really delicious cookie? And so just like I was just talking about there, where do we go? When we cut out judgment, really what we're doing is saying that I don't have to spend time going around hating on the rocks. I can just make a delicious cookie. What are the things that's gonna go in that delicious cookie? And I can give my attention to those. But I recognize, yeah, I'm not gonna put rocks in the cookie. 
Seaweed Kelp, yeah, he has thoughts on the Barbie movie. Uh, so what I've heard about the Barbie movie sounds great. I haven't seen it yet though. Uh, I've been uh, traveling um, and the Barbie movie, uh, there wasn't a good time for me to go and see it. And the last place was that I'm thinking I'm going to go see it tomorrow. Yeah, Monday, right? Yeah, so I take Mondays off. Um, so then I, I like to go do things. So maybe I'll go see the Barbie movie uh, tomorrow. I GTG now. Have a great day. Oh, I got to go now. Have a great day. And thanks a lot for answering our questions. Thanks, Bogus. Thanks for joining us and sharing questions. Jen, I said, thank you so much for everything you do for this community. Oh, no, thank you for being part of this community. I said, your videos and books have helped me so much. Hey, I'm really glad. Thanks for sharing that, Jen. Ryan. Said, what's your opinion of confession OCD? I feel bad if I don't confess to my parent. I know it sounds weird, but I feel I should confess my sexual experience to my family. What should I do to stop it? So Ryan, you were mentioning before the like going really hard on uh, judgment, right? Yeah, you weren't gonna judge anything. So yeah, you, it's, it's actually the same thing that fuels like a confession compulsion. Because uh, it's that rigidity. You see yourself going like really like right and wrong, like, oh, judgment, bad, okay, cut it all out, oh, sexual experience, must confess it all. Like, so actually, it's that kind of pressure from the brain. So cutting out the compulsion is really gonna be starting not to let that pressure push you around. Jorpanzu, he said, I have a question that I'm nervous to raise. Oh, let's have a panic attack. Because I've raised it on the Discord several times already. Oh, then, <laughs> then, then you know you don't have to ask you. The subject of friends and them drifting away, not texting back, not checking in with me. The above social situation feels as though it's only getting worse. Like the norm now seems to be a week, two weeks, three to reply to a message minimum, which I personally don't think is acceptable. Uh, so are you asking, so your question is, do you personally think it's acceptable? It sounds like you don't think it's acceptable. Our expectations and judgments about how other people act can create a lot of struggle because we don't control other people. So if you're then attaching meaning to actions you don't control, that's going to create a lot of struggle. It might be useful to look at, yeah, what, what is fueling? that need for people to act that particular way. Uh, what, what, do you, what are you afraid will happen if they don't act the way you want them to? Because, um, yeah, there might be some kind of sensitive or painful feelings there. Oh, Mike, thank you so much for the donation. I appreciate it. And you asked a question here. So he said, in regards to rumination, when I discovered that I was ruminating compulsively about how to stop compulsively ruminating, I understood the issue I was having was stopping rumination. Oh, Mike, thanks for sharing that. It's great to recognize, right? Again, it's that, like, the moment we see that we're, like, trying to clean away this thing perfectly, uh, and then we just end up doing it more and more, and then we get more and more upset because we're not cleaning it away, so... Yeah, thank you so much for the support. Thanks for sharing that today. It's so useful for people to understand that. Yeah, I appreciate it. Josh, he said, can intrusive thoughts be like images sometimes? It's like my mind makes me think I'm seeing things, which causes me to feel like I'm losing my mind when I know there's nothing. Yes, yeah, so... My most recent video answers this question. So can you have intrusive feelings? But also explains, of course, you can have intrusive anything because it's not about the image. It's not about the image, the voice, the thought, whatever. The problem comes from you judging it as this, like it means something. Oh, this means I'm losing my mind. That's the thing that makes it intrusive. It has nothing to do with the content. So it's really helpful to recognize intrusive thoughts are a compulsion. Thoughts are just there or feelings are just there, or images are just there, voices, whatever. But then when we go, whoa, that means something, 
then we create the problem. Then we make it into an intruder. Oh, and so Joe Panzer, you continue. So he said, and often it feels like people are just replying out of obligation when they eventually do feel lonely and disconnected all the time. But I'm unable to go towards the thing I value if everyone is too busy to talk. Well, so yeah, a couple of things, Stripin. So yeah, you did, you apologize for the length. Uh, you never have to apologize for that. But I would point out, because you know you've written out this many times before, that it's part of the compulsion. The like, that somehow the like, if you explain it all again and again, that's gonna deliver some kind of solution to controlling other people or to controlling this, this difficult feeling. So it is useful to start to see that. And like you saw at the beginning, oh, I've explained this many times before already. That is the moment to stop. You're like, oh, like, why do I want to explain this again and again? And so it's because it's also, I don't know if you caught it at the very beginning, I was, I was talking about this, like how we give time and energy to things. So if we, if we give a lot of time and energy to the problem, it's like we have to keep giving it because the brain's like, oh, well, no, like you like giving attention to this. Like, okay, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? And then we give more attention to it. We write it out a different way. We think about it a different way. We're like, well, what if, what if I do it in this scenario? Maybe that'll solve it. But the brain just wants us to spin on it again and again and again. And yeah, we don't have to. So I see a thing you mentioned there. I'm unable to go towards the thing I value if everybody is too busy to talk. So values are always about the context in which we find ourselves. So we do have to switch quickly. Uh, and so actually often something I see come up a lot is that people will pick values that require controlling other people and then get upset that they can't do what they value. But values are going to be about things we give. Uh, so yeah, if we, it's like if we go into the wilderness and we say like, I value being a friend of animals. But then we run up to an animal and the animal runs away. And we're like, oh, how can I be a friend of animals if the animals won't even talk to me? And we keep doing that. And then we, of course, are very frustrated and we blame ourselves. But actually the value depended on controlling something we don't control. Um, and so there's nothing strange happening there. It's not about us. Uh, but then, because we then will chase that. Like somehow, oh, if I get people to do this thing I want them to do, it's going to mean something about me. It's going to mean that I'm very likable. It's going to mean that I'm good. Because people don't usually do this, but they do it for me. Right? This cat, I don't know if you caught I was mentioning the cat earlier that like, doesn't like people, or like, yeah, this cat doesn't like anybody else, but they like me. They'll sit in my lap without clawing my face. We do attach a lot of reassurance to it. Uh, but yeah, what if we don't have to? What if social interactions with other people were about what we want to give to them, how we want to support them? Hope. I said, I have a new friend, and they make life easier. They inspire me to go after my values when it was harder to push myself alone. I feel like I'm depending on their presence, and what if they leave? Shouldn't I do it by myself without the help of a friend? Mm. So well, what if you can do both? Uh, you see that you're capable of doing these things. So yeah, sometimes you may explore doing them on your own. But also, when we can do things with others, like why not celebrate that? Uh, again, like we can make things easy. We don't have to be like, oh no, I, I need to do everything alone. I've got to force myself to do difficult things. Uh, like we were talking about earlier with Hyle. Uh, yeah, we don't, we don't have to be like, oh, everything must be this super intense workout. No, life will supply enough difficult workouts that yeah, we see an opportunity to let something be easy. That's wonderful. Let's let it be easy. Also, we can learn from that. Um, we can bring that ease into our lives when we're not with that person, too. <laughs> oh, Mud, you're going to supply the guide on how to have a panic attack in a hotel in Marrakesh? That, that would be wonderful. 
I would love to read that. A lot of people would find that useful. Khan. Khan, you said, I've quit bad sugar and started cardio last week. Any tips for a beginner to make it stick? There's no such thing as bad sugar. Bad, I don't even know. Is that like sugar that, like genocidal sugar? Like sugar that, I don't know, is like, drawn with like an evil face in a cartoon. Yeah, so that would be my tip. Uh, there's no such thing as, as bad sugar. Um, and uh, yeah, if you're starting cardio, that's fun. Um, yeah, so I make it about things you enjoy instead of like hating on something or judging something. So yeah, if you started cardio and want to make it stick, how are you going to make it enjoyable and easy so that it's something that continues uh, so like a way that I make fitness easy because I move around a lot uh, often in places I just did it here oh, no, I can't, you can't see it oh right over here is a yoga mat so when I get to a place so I'll often look for a place where I know there's gonna be enough space uh, to do something like yoga and then one of the first things I'll do uh, is I'll get uh, containers for the kitchen that I can put food in because most Airbnbs don't have them so I'll I'll get a container that I can use so I can cook food and store food, cuts down on garbage, helps me like have food that can nourish me. And then I'll also get a yoga mat um, in uh, the new place. And then that, because the yoga mat's making it easy for me to quickly go, oh, okay, I have 30 minutes right now, roll out the yoga mat, I can do a 20 minute uh, yoga workout. Uh, so finding, yeah, those ways that make it easy for you. Okay, and Kyle, you're going to do, I'll be doing how to have a panic attack while your mom is talking to you about Robbie Williams concert tickets. <laughs> very, very niche, but a lot of people, a lot, it's happened to a lot of people. We, uh, we definitely need that, that kind of panic attack guide. Blue for 785, I hope you're having a good evening. Oh, sir, Ahmed. Oh, I appreciate the kind words. Oh, I'm glad, yeah, you found these resources and this work, yeah, useful in your journey. I appreciate you joining today. Michael said, I recently cut out my drinking compulsion entirely. Okay, when I went to a doctor for a checkup and for chronic headache, I mentioned my OCD struggles. He stated that I have traits of autism. Shocked. I now think that I don't know myself as well as I thought and can see my life behavior through a different lens. What if I'm wrong about myself and why I do the things I do? Yeah, so I'm, right, not a one to get caught up in all of the different labels because also, yeah, you can go to many different doctors and get a bunch of labels if you're going, want to label a problem. I like to look at where we want to go. And yeah, we're all going to have different traits and challenges going where we want to go, but making it about that. Yeah, if you want to put a label on yourself, what is the label that you're going to find useful that's going to help you do the things you want to do? That's all I would look at there. Mike said, I've really begun to look at OCD as a set of bad habits that I created to deal with internal, external experiences that I don't like. And as a result, if I change my behavior, the OCD symptoms were like, yeah, it's a great way to describe it. Right? We are just trying to control uncertainty. And yeah, we develop a bunch of ways to do that. And over time, we may learn, oh, actually, yeah, those ways I was trying to control uncertainty, not so useful to me. And then we learn some new ways. Blooper said, last time you mentioned it's useful to identify something to step into when stepping back from a compulsion. I have something, but it is outweighed by pe keeping people safe. How do I proceed? Mm, so I just, yeah, what you, if you outweighed it by choosing the other thing, are you, like, are you asking because you don't want to outweigh it? Because you're the one outweighing it. So if, if you want to do the other thing, then that's going to mean you 
are elevating the importance of the other thing. But if you want to elevate the importance of something else, then like that's only up to you. Oh, Michael, yeah, I see. The, uh, before I got to your question, yeah, we were already discussing labels. Adam, yeah, I'm way, wow, is that clock? We'll see, I may be way behind. We'll get to them, we'll get to everybody's questions. Adam, hello to Taiwan. It's a long time, I know, see, it's great to see you here. Hey, Adam, thanks for joining, it's great to see you too. Sir Ahmed, he said, bro, you are a real lifesaver. You just transformed my life 360 degrees. I was fighting OCD for four years and you just solved it in a matter of seconds. I can't thank you enough. Um, I wish I could meet you and hug you <laughs> for saving my life from the monster. Oh, Ahmed, I appreciate it. You're the one doing all of the work though. So no, congratulations to you like taking this information and turning it into action. But seeing too, you get to continue to turn it into action on the steps ahead. So yeah, take the monster on an adventure. We look forward to hearing about all of the things you do. Uh, yeah, and if the monster shows up, ah, you know how to handle it. Oh, and then Mundo took out their Doberman. Thank you, Mundo, for joining us. James. Said also just starting a business, having intrusive thoughts that buying big purchases that I need for it will cause other bad things to happen. So I'm just go ahead and buy them now. Yeah, great. Like it's really common. You see, we step forward to do the things we want to do, and the brain goes, "Wow, like bad things will happen." You can take those steps forward. Um, yeah, and the brain's just trying to protect you. So often the way I approach that is, "Hey, I'm taking the step forward. I'm going to show the brain what we can do now." I understand it's scared. It is like this kid there going, whoa, can you really buy that? And going, okay, like I'll show you how we're gonna do it. Um, and that kid can always be there and be shocked and amazed. I'm gonna, said, I see what you mean. The donut, our raison d'etre, exactly. Or our current personal goals, exactly. They'll change all the time. They might just be for today. And yeah, life will stress and scare us along the way. It's welcome to do that. James, totally. Yeah, he said, uh, there's gonna be a lot of sweating and uncomfortable experiences for a while, cutting things out. Yeah, but having that focus uh, on the things you're growing there is gonna be so useful. Erica said, can we apply the wanting to lift any weight approach to physical experiences like fatigue and pain, etc.? Lately, I've been having intrusive physical sensations rather than intrusive thoughts. Yeah, so it's, it's even why well, if you explore acceptance and commitment therapy skills, particularly around chronic pain. Uh, so there's been a lot of research done on uh, ACT and helping people with pain. Uh, and yeah, so seeing how it's, we don't have to get rid of the sensation, but we, we might still incorporate that into the context of our values. We might still say, oh, like, it's really difficult to do this particular thing today. Okay, well, I am still going to bring along this physical sensation, but maybe I am going to adjust the goals a bit rather than an all or nothing approach. Like, oh, this thing has interfered with the thing I wanted to do. Let's do nothing. Uh, and so, yeah, finding those ways to make space for the intrusive whatever while taking a step forward and being kind to it is then often how, just like with intrusive thoughts, the brain starts to throw it up less. ABJKL said, any suggestions on racing thoughts and having trouble going to sleep? How to approach that? Yeah, is to not approach it, but to instead start at the beginning of the day and look at how you're interacting with thoughts. So if we've been teaching our brain all day, like let's spin on thoughts, let's fix this, let's control this, what about this, I've got to do this, and we're just doing that all day, when we get to the end of the day, of course the brain's still doing that. Like why wouldn't it? That's what we taught it to do all day. So when somebody's running into issues with racing thoughts with sleep, the first thing I do is ask them how they start their day. Because that's probably where the wheel spinning begins. 
Amy. Yeah, he said, there is no such thing as a bad thought. There is a thought and thinking. We can't control thoughts, but we can control what we think about. I'm learning this. Yeah, that's great to learn. Right? We don't control what pops up, but we control what we do with it. <laughs> well, Erica, this is a great point. So Erica said, if we are our brain's pets, we need to learn to be more like cats then, than dogs. Become ungovernable. Absolutely. That's what it is. Like the brain's gonna be like, you gotta do this, you gotta do this. And you're like, rah, knock over a plant. Yeah, as Marlo said, yeah. I'd rather push this glass of water off the table. Eleven Ellie, you said, advice for obsessing about my age, 24, and getting older. I compulsively compare my age with people online and calculate how much time I have left till 25. Oh, Ellie. Uh, so, uh, so you said advice for obsessing. So it's going to be useful not to, <laughs> not to obsess, right? So there's a whole bunch of compulsions there. Useful not to do that calculating, that comparing. Two, when we're doing uh, compulsions like that, right, we... Uh, are taking ourselves away from living our lives. And so then we get even more panicked about not living our lives because we're spending our life uh, like measuring age and comparing and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, I would look at what is it you really want to give and create in the world? And how are you going to start doing that? Um, and But not making that about like needing to chase something else. So in life, it's very useful to see you're not in a game with other people. If you're putting yourself in a game with other people, leave the stadium. Get out of the stadium. Do not play the game. You can explore life. It's not a competition. It's an exploration in a wilderness. Um, and you can go and see the things you want to see in the wilderness and give the things you want to give. If you want to sit by a tree in a beautiful spot and that's all you want to do, that's a wonderful thing to do because you want to do it and you're just being you. Uh, so yeah, I would explore that. Mike, yeah, he said the key for me is to do the things that cause anxiety so that I have the opportunity to learn how to handle those feelings without engaging in compulsions. Yet, the more I practice, the better I get, totally. Because it, it is that if we just go and do those things we want to do, so related to what we were just talking about, if we go and do them, yeah, life is going to bring up uncertainties and anxieties. And then we get to handle them. But if we stop and we're like, I've got to go fix anxiety and then I'm going to go live my life, then uh, we just end up waiting and waiting and waiting. So Ahmed said, I know thoughts aren't re reality. But when such thoughts come, my hands and body get stiff. I can't control myself. It's like someone shoots me inside my body. Sometimes it becomes hard to deal with them. But I try best not to engage. That's my first priority. I know thoughts can be stupid and thoughts are not reality. Mm, I'm trying to find... Uh, so one of the things that you can watch out for there, Ahmed, is the... Um, yeah, well, often, the brain will often jump to physical sensations the moment we notice thought and we don't engage with it. And so, like, that, like, physical sensation of stiffening up, like you said, like, somebody shot you inside. So it's going to be really useful to make space for that. Like, that's the stuff to want. You go, okay, I get it. I, and to give it compassion, right? Because the body in that moment is going, whoa, dangerous thing. We've got to fight or we've got to run away. We've got to freeze. Giving a hug to that, be like, oh, I get it. I know you're scared there, but let's take this feeling and take a step forward. So, because then you start to show it that the thing, the uncertainty is not dangerous. By you making space for the physical sensations, the brain can start to learn that. Uh, but yeah, you'll, you, you'll have to do that with the uncomfortable physical sensations. Cats are excellent role models for healthy boundaries and laziness. It's true. But yeah, and so Ahmed, as Mike said below, for me in those instances, I stopped trying to control myself. I'm learning to let those feelings run. Absolutely, yeah, thanks for sharing that, Mike. 
Ryan said, how to be okay with doing something weird. My brain will always check and judge whether it's okay for me to do something. I try to not assure my brain, but how can I be okay doing something? Yeah, so at first, don't be okay with it, but do it anyway. So that's why values are so useful. Values are very much like recipe instructions. Like how do you make cookies well? It's not about getting a feeling that it's okay to make cookies well. We set the values, we follow the recipe. The brother said, I saw you posted on Instagram about self-talk. I was curious, at what point are we meant to allow the thoughts to happen versus actively speaking to ourselves more positively? Uh, so yeah, I wouldn't see those as uh, contradictory. The self-talk is, is more they're looking at, because like if you are talking to yourself, uh, yeah, to be aware of how you're talking to yourself. Uh, so it's more just in those moments, oh, like, why am I being such an asshole to this person? I like this person. I'm talking to them right now. Okay, like, I'm going to talk to them differently. Uh, so, yeah, it's just more about that. So I'd say more about, yeah, like, if you were already talking to yourself. Uh, if, yeah, some thoughts are running that are just, like, really critical of you, uh, there I would look more at, like, just recognizing... Like, that's like the random guy in the street shouting. Uh, so there I'd look more at, like, just reckon that that has nothing to do with me. And even, like, there, yeah, tease it. Be like, yeah, Brian, you, oh, you want to say something horrible than, about me? Like, what about this? What about this? Like, surely you can come up with better things than that. Uh, but also to recognize that often when the brain's just running on some, like, kind of criticisms of us, there's probably some fear there uh, so I would also look past what those criticisms are at, oh like what is the thing my brain's trying to control right now um, so yeah it might be that I, or like a Instagram post that I shared just the other day you're going to use different tools at different times in different scenarios in different situations Ah, uh, yeah, Mud says here, I'm thinking of keeping death close as dying is okay. Well, dying will happen. It's like, uh, and so yeah, if right now it's like dying is not okay. Uh, well, like it does happen a lot. Oh, and it is part of life. So it can be useful to explore like the judgments like, and labels we've attached to it. Trisha, he said, why do I feel falling for the same pattern of OCD? Why it feels real every time when I've already dealt with it, it makes me angry. Where does my learning go in the moment when I want it most? Well, so you touched on something there that is a common, uh, mis I don't know what to call it, a common challenge. Uh, people run into you, there's a couple things. Like one where you said dealt with it. Uh, I'm curious what that means, but if you like, for instance, know the thing is wrong, that is not dealing with it because the brain just cares about the compulsion. It's not about, oh, I know that's not real. No, 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 The brain just wants you to do the thing over and over and over and over and over again. So we've got to cut it out. But the common challenge that people run into is judging something as real as meaning it's okay to do compulsion. And it's not. When we're talking about these skills, when we talk about cutting out compulsions, it's not about whether it's irrational or real or unreal, or it's, oh, that's an OCD thought, so I'm not going to do compulsions. Oh, but this is a real thing that happened, so I'm going to do compulsions. It's got to be a focus on the compulsions and cutting them out. It doesn't matter if it's real or not. Ah, hi, he said, but it's complex, because what if the obsession is, I don't deserve, and the compulsion is, no, I deserve it. Enjoying something while you're fighting to see if you deserve enjoying, it's kind of complex. Mm, but that's why I find it's so helpful to identify a set of values that we're going to be consistent with, uh, particularly with caring for ourselves. Uh, and so, yeah, you may say, like, look, I deserve to take care of myself. And so when the brain's like, well, oh, you don't deserve that, they're recognizing, oh, no, like, 
I, it's not even a question of deserving. This is a thing I do to care for myself. And so there it's, it's kind of like, again, leaving the stadium. So the brain wants to have a debate. We're like, yeah, but I don't, it's not even about deserving or not deserving. This is a thing I give to myself. It's just a thing I do. Asmina, Asmina said, how can I stop focusing on try not to do compulsions? Try not to focus on not focusing on compulsions or feelings. Yes, yeah, so having that clear idea of what's that thing I want to grow and build. What's my donut? Uh, Ahmed, I, I would not give daily precious advices. If I had kids, I would just, I would just throw donuts at them all day. Rocky fighter. So what is the idea? Give me an example of doing. Mm, Rocky, I'm not sure I understand your question. Kimberly said, so speaking of rewards and punishments, can it be helpful to set these up for ourselves? Or is that harmful? Like after accomplishing a difficult task, allowing myself to buy myself a present? Oh, so Kimberly, this is great. This relates to what Heil was just mentioning about deserving. So I find it really useful to break all of that kind of like, like, oh, you did a hard thing, you deserve a thing, and, or like, oh, something bad happened, you don't deserve it. No, so I, I find it to, like, one of the things I often suggest to people is to yeah, identify things that just help you, help nourish you and thrive. And so, because, yeah, maybe you only give yourself things you really enjoy after a difficult experience or if you've earned it. Nah, like, set up a schedule for giving yourself those things. Uh, like you might say, like once a month, I take myself to a new restaurant and I just enjoy having food I've never had before. Um, I don't have to earn it and I don't have to deserve it. It is just a thing I do to take care of me. Like it's like seeing ourselves as plants. And once a month, we give the plant some fertilizer, uh, making these consistent practices because you're you. There's no, we don't have to question whether you're deserving or whether you have to earn something. Oh, you being you, you've earned it by existing. Now we just want to care for you and help you thrive. ABGKL, you said, so with Zen meditation, if you're sitting quietly, you're essentially doing it. Yeah. Remember, quietly includes up here. Delociraptor. I found your channel just recently, and I very much appreciate your insights. I have a situation right now that fits a pattern where I don't know how to best challenge my OCD. I want to organize things in my house, but there's a dust all over everything. I'm avoiding organizing because I know it would take a long time to both clean all the dust and organize it. Would it challenge OCD to ignore the dust and just organize, or to stop avoiding the situation and just take the time to both clean and organize? So what I would do there is break it down into smaller activities. You see the brain? And it loves to do this. It loves to make everything super big and complex. And then we don't take action because uh, it's just like, oh, well, if we did that, then we'd have to fix this. And then we'd see this problem. And you've got to do the whole thing and so on. So I'd take a step back. So what I always ask people is, uh, so we look first at your values. So what are, so in your house, what helps you live? Uh, what do you care about doing? And then we look at, okay, based on that, what you want to do in your home, what do we want to organize or clean to make that easier? And we just do that one thing, not the whole thing. We just take care of one thing that's gonna make your life a little bit more enjoyable. Because maybe it's you do this thing frequently and you're always like, oh, that thing is still so dusty oh, I wish that was organized, and we keep hating on it, but then we go, oh, but I gotta organize the whole thing, or do I have to dust? And then we don't help ourselves. So what's that one thing that you could organize or clean that you're going to see most often that is going to help you, and then take care of that? And then the next day, or a couple of days later, go to the second most helpful thing. And so having that approach that's about what's really gonna support you. Um, yeah, and there's some things you might not get to. But you're going to get to the things that you really care about. Brent. said two questions. 
I struggle with checking compulsions. Doesn't society teach this often? Growing up in school, we're always told if you have more time on a test, go back and check. <laughs> oh, Brent, you had more time on those tests. Intelligence, it always gets us into trouble. And second, I love mindfulness, but don't do so many of us spend time daydreaming trying to distract ourselves from a job we don't enjoy. Oh no! Or some daily mundane task we have to do but don't want to. Uh, so, yeah, a couple things. Yeah, we're, we are often told to check, uh, but I would say probably uh, one of the areas people learn to check more early on uh, or throughout society is because somebody else's anxiety. Somebody else is worried about something going wrong, so like, make sure you check on that. Um, that can happen a lot at work too. Somebody's, you know, some manager is anxious about how they'll look, so they're constantly checking on you, constantly making you check to relieve their uncertainty and anxiety. Yeah, we're often taught that. On mindfulness. Uh, yeah, we, we can also enjoy mindlessness. Absolutely, we can wander around all of the time. But with the example, as you mentioned, like doing a mundane task, uh, or doing a job we don't like, it's actually going to be very useful to learn how to be present in that and find that enjoyment there. So especially the mundane task, there's nothing unenjoyable about that at all. You are existing on a planet in a massive universe in which we have found no other planets as amazing as our own. We found no other planets where you can do sweeping the floor. So yeah, if you're sweeping the floor, actually the reason we explore something like mindfulness can be to find that there's a lot of enjoyment and wonder in that task. So yeah, enjoy exploring Brent. ABGKL said, is there a connection between clutter and OCD? It's hard for me to declutter and create space. The clutter greatly interferes with daily activities. Uh, yeah, it's quite common. It can go in either direction. Um, the uh, but yeah, you notice how like all of the things will think about moving things or like oh I can't I can't take care of this right now I got to go on to this other thing, uh, yeah it comes up a lot if you want to take care of your space differently like that was something I really explored I was very messy because I used it for all sorts of different compulsions, uh, so yeah now it's actually great that like I can I actually have very little stuff right all my life fits in three bags, uh, but even before everything was only in three bags. A huge benefit of, I'd say, taking care of my mental health was that I, I could care for my space. Oh, Erica, absolutely. Sea salt chocolate chip cookie sounds delicious. Masha, you said, how do I join the Discord? Yeah, if you send me a DM on Instagram or if there's a contact form on my website, markfreeman.ca, uh, yeah, if you send a message through there, I'll send you an invite link. But when you send the message, share about what you want to give to the Discord server. Uh, it's not for like getting reassurance or like, it's focused on mental fitness, right? So it's not about uh, some kind of problem. It's about where we want to go. Chez said, so what's the deal with wanting to know and seeing certain things, for example, an urge to read a label or something random on the floor, like what's the background fear there? Often there is no background fear. Uh, fears are just one of the ways we do compulsions and chase certainty. But often, yeah, you, you've actually, like I, it's very common that people will say that, oh, I've dealt with all of my fears. Why am I still doing compulsions? Because yeah, the fear was never, the, the topic never matters. The brain just wants you <laughs> to spin and play and do compulsion. So yeah, we notice that, oh, I've got to have certainty about that. Be like, oh, no, I don't, I don't need it, I don't need it. Hi, uh, yeah, you said, oh, so first of all, thank you for the kind words in your message. Oh, I appreciate you being part of our community and sharing. You said, what do you think about gratitude practices and affirmations? Uh, so I, I find a uh, gratitude practice really useful. Uh, I think part of that though is seeing like a gratitude practice that we're not trying to get something and also gratitude doesn't have to be about good things. But the gratitude is just something we give. 
Uh, and so having gratitude can really be about giving gratitude. Uh, so that's how I approach a gratitude practice. That like at the end of the day, I'm not like going back through like good things and saying thank you for them. I say my gratitude practice is throughout the day exploring how I can give gratitude. And so at any moment, just like, oh, I, I really appreciate that tree. Or there's a person walking by and like, I hope they have a good day. I like, I really appreciate that they're here. Uh, and so, yeah, throughout the day, just gratitude to existence uh, is what I like. And then affirmations, yeah, like I, I'm not a, a fan of affirmations like to get something or control something, but to recognize reality, uh, to again, like to give. Uh, so, yeah, something that might be an affirmation uh, that's just like recognizing, like I was mentioning earlier, like just like you're deserving. It's not a debate. Uh, recognizing you can nourish yourself and you want to celebrate yourself. Uh, yeah, not a thing we're doing like to fix something or get something, but just that recognition of fact. Uh, so in that sense, uh, yeah, an affirmation, like very much of like affirming reality, um, affirming love to ourselves, mm, then I find that really useful. Ah, Anu, thank you for the kind words. I'm glad the videos have really helped you. Thank you. Everybody, I see too. Yeah, we've already gone two hours. We still, I'm at least 30 minutes. If I look at the comments, like times and the questions, I'm 30 minutes behind where we are right now. But we'll get it. Let's just, today we're just having a marathon session. I really appreciate everybody sharing. Uh, yeah, sharing your comments and your questions and your insights today just being here and being part of this. So yeah, thank you so much. We will keep going. So Erica, yeah, the, this is a great question. So, so what's the difference between making it easy and wanting to lift heavy weights? When you practice writing in the mall food court, uh, were you making it easy? It sounds hard. I'd get hungry. <laughs> Yeah, so it, it depends on the place, right? Like right now I'm in a country, because uh, it varies, right? I find some countries, malls have really great restaurants, like a mall food court. So they're like a, that's where you go, like even for like a nice meal, because there'll be like some nice restaurants and then there'll be, but even like the local restaurants then are like really good. They just happen to be in the mall. And then there are some countries where malls don't have good food. So right now I, I get the, there's a mall I walked through yesterday and there's so many good restaurants I want to go back to. And like it was packed with uh, families like having like a, I guess like a Saturday lunch, probably packed again today. Uh, so yeah, sometimes malls aren't good places to write because they're like all of the seats are taken by eating. That exercise though, I would say it's, it's about, and so for anybody that's not familiar, right, I used to uh, have all sorts of compulsions around writing and I needed to write in like the right way and have the right feelings and so on and there couldn't be noise. I struggled with misophonia. There are all sorts of noises I couldn't be around. I'd get so frustrated. Like, why are people making those noises? And especially like chewing noises. So like being around people eating was not a place where writing was possible. So then it was about saying, okay, like I want the, the freedom and flexibility to be able to write wherever I want to write. So first I, I set out something like that, which yeah, absolutely is going to be challenging. But then we also look at, well, how am I making it hard? To write right now. Well, I have all of these rules around writing, and that makes it really difficult to find a place to write, and it makes it very frustrating when I'm writing. So it is both doing something that's challenging, but then also saying, okay, but I'm gonna be lazy while I do it. So yeah, that person is gonna be eating right beside me right now, and they keep laughing about things that aren't funny. I can hear the conversation, and like, oh, I can smell things. And the easy part is saying, I don't have to fix any of that, it can be there. And so, yeah, and so, like I was saying, we're gonna do different things in different situations. It's always gonna be a combination of doing challenging things and then looking at how to make them easy. But we're only doing those challenging things if they're on our path. So this, like we were discussing earlier, we don't have to go and pursue some kind of challenging thing just cause we're like, well, I'm, I heard that avoiding tiger, I heard avoidance is bad and this tiger makes me scared so I'm not going to avoid it. No, like, 
in, in that story, right, the, that kid wanted to go and see other animals at the zoo. So it's seeing what is the thing we want to do. Doing that may require us to do some challenging things, but we're going to make those challenges easy. So enjoy making challenging things easy. Mud. You said, I just thought I could clean the floor, but I ended up body checking. So then I returned to being still to stop the checking. But er, stuckness. No question, just stuck. Stuckness, though, is like a feeling that comes up a lot. Right? So even welcoming stuckness can be okay. Oh, bell word. So tell us about your 20 minute yoga workout. Oh, like if I have. 30 minutes, I'll do a 20 minute yoga workout. And I just, I, there's a bunch of YouTube yoga channels uh, that I'll go to often. And so I'll just, I'll just go to one because they're kind of different types of yoga. And so I'll be like, okay, I'm feeling like this type of yoga uh, or this type of yoga would be useful because of what I did at the gym yesterday. Let's just go in there. And then usually they'll have a, uh, a workout that's like 20 minute yoga workout, something, something. And I'll just do it. Hamza, welcome. You pop over to YouTube and here we are. Thanks for joining us. Frano, hello. You're from Croatia. Thanks for joining us from Croatia today. James said, my intrusive thoughts have always put my life on hold. As always in the past, I have a thought I can't do something because I haven't done a compulsion or had the thought if I do it, bad things will happen. Making a good start into doing what I value. Yeah, especially as you're growing things now and recognizing that. Because you also, through that, we really start to see just how wrong our brain was. That we always like, well, yeah, I can't do this thing, and it really feels like we can't do it. But then you start to do it, and then suddenly you're doing something, and the brain's like, oh, okay, fine, go ahead. And like, wait, you said bad things would happen if I did this. The brain's like, no, 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 I don't care. Here, go worry about this. Like you see like just how wrong the brain is. So yeah, we can go and do the things we want to do. Blooper said, yes, I want to do the thing, but if it leads to bad things happening to people I love, uh, it doesn't seem worth it. Oh, so Blooper, this is about like the kind of, uh, yeah, so Blooper, that's the classic right, OCD compulsion. Right? You'll always, you always be able to think of some terrible thing that could happen. Chez, uh, I scrolled a fair bit up in the question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Everyone's asked such great questions today. It's so... Uh, useful to share. <laughs> oh, and Erica, yeah, get, bro, great point for age. Yeah, how to stop obsessing about turning 25? Turn 40. Yeah, turning 40 is great. I like, well, turning 30 was really good. And then I really like turning 40. Uh, yeah. The, yeah, I don't, under, yeah, I don't, uh, I enjoy uh, living. <laughs> And uh, growing, so yeah, don't, any kind of message, yeah, when you see like messages in the media about like youth or like um, people doing lots of things, like all the like, oh, we've got to prevent aging or something like that, no, uh, or like all of this, uh, you hear about those people who do like really expensive compulsions to try to like uh, prevent aging, like it was like, you know, somebody who spends like millions a year on like weird aging prevention things. They're just, those are though so much, spending so much of life trying to avoid a fear uh, is, yeah. I, I see the pain there, but it's much more enjoyable to live. Mike, thank you so much for the donation. I see you here said, yeah, thanks Mark. Uh, you've helped save my life. And I'm now at the point where I'll leave a lot of this OCD help behind. I'm forever grateful. Oh, Mike, congratulations. Right? It's because also you see there what's so useful that, yeah, we get to go and live our life now. We don't have to stay here with this stuff. And like we get to step away from it. So yeah, there are these challenges. We tackle them. But yeah, then we move on. We live our lives, we make it about the things we really want to see. And so that's wonderful. Yeah, so thanks for sharing that today. Thank you for 
the opportunity to be part of your journey. And I look forward to seeing wherever your journey takes you now. Oh, and you sit here, yeah, I plan on writing a letter about my process of recovery and I'll share it with you, Mark. Oh, thank you, yes, please do. Hopefully my experience will have some insight you can share with your clients, appreciate you, peace. Oh yeah, Mike, thank you so much, yeah, please. Uh, feel free to reach out through the, there's the contact form on my website or uh, DM on Instagram. Yeah, I'd love to hear about your journey and what you found useful. Yeah, thank you for sharing that with everybody. Yeah, as Erica said below, yeah, we'd love to read it on the Mental Fitness Discord too if you want to share it there. Seaweed kelp, so gotta head out. I hope everyone has a nice day, week. Oh, thank you for stopping by. Shiresha said, how to respond to physical manifestation of anxiety in an SOS situation? Also, any advice on responding mindfully to a situation thought which makes you very anxious and cognition is the last thing on your mind? Yeah, so in both scenarios, uh, you know, the experience we're having is totally normal, right? Yeah, so if there's a difficult situation, yeah, what's the body's going to go, ah, like we're supposed to fight or run away or freeze or fawn or do something. And so that's really natural. And so that's why... It can help to, it really helped me to approach this work as being about having uncomfortable experiences. So it's not about, I've got to work on anxiety or intrusive thoughts and physical sensations are separate. No, because we're just interacting with uncomfortable experiences. And so if we separate them, then yeah, often then we end up doing a bunch of compulsions around the physical experience. But yeah, it's no different than the mental experience. So that's what I'd look at. Yeah, you can have those sensations, just like you'd have uh, some uncomfortable mental sensations. But then it really, this is why it helps so much to identify values and know what we care about. Because yeah, in that moment, we can't think of what we want to do. In many ways, values are to help us when we can't think. That's why I found them so helpful with cutting out compulsions, because I'd encounter an uncertainty in that moment, you know, panic attack, I can't think of anything. I don't know what I want. All I want is to get rid of the anxiety or get rid of the fear. So identifying values is so that when we step into that situation, we, we can see where to go. And that's, that's how I learned about values. First, in a business context, that we would share about values with organizations we were helping innovate. Um, and so the facilitator um, that I was learning under, one of the things he would do, his name is Tom Mujek, uh, one of the things he would do at the very start of in like a strategy workshop or an innovation workshop is draw the uncertainty curve. Show people, like, look, yeah. So basically, say, look, your company is failing. And because of the things you're doing repeatedly, just like we do with mental health, we're like doing these things over and over again. It's creating all these problems. We've got to learn how to do new things. The moment we start to do new, do new, do new things, you're going to experience a lot of uncertainty and difficult feelings. We're going to use values to not fall back to the old way of doing things. Those values help us move through those difficult feelings. Chess said, I have a lot of conversations in my head, oh, like past ones or potential ones. Yeah, it's really common. Why is that happening? And why does the brain enjoy doing that? Whoa, whoa, whoa you're the one doing it. Uh, yeah, so no, so it's really, it's really helpful to know that's something we do. Uh, and so starting to notice that and be like, oh, I don't have to plan that right now. I don't have to think about that right now. Uh, and so it helped me to look at areas where I would consistently do that. Like, for instance, I might, you know, be walking somewhere, uh, walking to work, and I would just think, oh, that's the time when we'll have conversations, potential conversations about things that could happen today so we can prevent them. No. But saying, okay, when I'm going to walk to work today, I'm going to say hello to trees. And then it's practicing, and while you're doing it, yeah, the brain will run off. Oh, but shouldn't we have this conversation because somebody at work made this comment yesterday? What if they're going to, what if they don't like you? What if something's going to go wrong? That's a great tree over there, that's a really nice tree. And you bring it back to that. But yeah, you engaging with it and having those debates, that's, that's us. Love yourself the way you wish they did. You said greetings. Uh, all special shout out to Smith Brook Hollow. That's, that's nice of you to give a shout out. Uh, Delasa Raptor, thank you so much for the donation. I appreciate it. He said, thank you. Well, thank you for joining us today. And thank you for the support. It really helps with, yeah, doing these live streams. I really appreciate the donations. Yeah, thank you.
Bisler refresh said, how do we deal with physical feelings that come with depression and anxiety? Yeah, so I don't know, so I was just sharing about that. The, so not seeing it as all as separate stuff, right? There is gonna be physical discomfort, emotional discomfort, mental discomfort. It's about how we interact with it. So yeah, we can have all of it. Well, we go and do the things we care about. Oh, Erica, I thank you so much for the kind words about the detailed answers. Love yourself the way you wish. Absolutely, you're back in the land of edible circles of life. Let us enjoy the donuts or cosmic bagels. Yes. Oh, the, the ride is going wonderfully today. ABGKL. Uh, uh, I'm, well, you're welcome. So these sessions are very eye-opening and offer much-needed glimmers of hope. Well, thank you for joining us today. Oh, SP, thank you for the kind words said, oftentimes I'll do an exposure and then experience deep regret for days or weeks afterwards. I'm sure you've covered this somewhere, but any tips? So right away when I see somebody say exposure, do you mean exposure and response prevention? Like you cut out a compulsion or are you just exposing yourself to things you don't like? Because yeah, if you're just exposing yourself, yeah, I'd, I'd question the usefulness of that. Yeah, what are you trying to do? Um, cause yeah, it's gotta be about cutting out the compulsions and then that's just something we can celebrate. Maybe JKL, you said, I totally get what people are saying about obsessing about being a certain age. I kid you not. When I was age nine, I obsessed about no longer being single digits when turning 10. Yep. Get it. Yeah. As soon as you get to like a decade, that's huge. But you say, what is that? We, we like to worry about things and attach meaning to things and cling on to things. Erica says, when I was younger, I thought the best year of your life was the one that matched the date you were born. So if you were born March 9th, your best year would be age 9, all downhill after that. <laughs> oh. Oh, this is good. So I was, I, oh. This. I bet this year would be really, I bet, would people get to like 2050? I guess nobody's born on the 50th. What would be the latest you could be born? Oh, the 31st. When we get to 2031, that person has been waiting their whole life for that. Yeah, oh, and Erica, you actually pointed that out. No one could ever have their best year after 31. Yeah, who knows where this stuff comes from? It is hilarious. Hello. And Erica, yeah, you said marathon stream today, but that is, we've come to the end. Well, everybody, thank you so much, everybody, for joining for our marathon stream today. We've, we've hit, we're almost right on two hours and 30 minutes. So I really appreciate it. It was, it was really fun to explore all this with you today. Uh, yeah, thank you, everybody, uh, for your... Uh, Donations, uh, it was, uh, I really appreciate um, the support and I appreciate everybody coming together today uh, to share your questions and yeah, share your insights as well. So in the week ahead, like I was talking about at the very beginning, it's going to really help to make it about where we're going. Not about, oh, I've got this problem, I've got to fix this problem and give all my attention to this problem this week. Right? What do you actually want to be growing? Oh, and then SP, yeah, explaining about the exposure, you said, when working with a cl clinician, I do the response prevention. But when alone, there's a lot of safety behaviors, rumination. Yeah, so get up to look at that, because, yeah, if you're doing a exposure and then a bunch of compulsions, that's, that's just compulsions. The response prevention is the piece. Like the exposure is kind of irrelevant. We're only doing the exposure to cut out the compulsions. Uh, so if we do the exposure and then do a bunch of compulsions, yeah, that's just that's natural. That's gonna like create more difficulty. Mm -hmm. Thank you for showing. Yeah, and Erica, thank you. I will. I will hydrate. I will go and enjoy some breakfast as well. I only had first breakfast earlier. So now we'll go and do second breakfast. So yeah, thank you so much, everybody 
for joining. We got, oh, love yourself the way you wish. It's going fishing now. Toodles, enjoy. Erica, thank you so much for the sunflower as well. Sunflowers to everybody. Enjoy your fishing and your bagels and your donuts and doing the things you really want to do this week. All right, thank you so much, everybody. We'll talk to you later.